Uh, welcome to this special event today. Uh, this is a Q&A uh, committed to answering uh, questions of criticism mm, from opponents of objectivism or from those who have some doubts, have some disagreements. Uh, and my guest tonight is, or today for Americans, is Dr. Yaron Brook, the chairman of uh, the board of the Ayn Rand Institute, uh, author, podcaster, uh, finance guy, also entrepreneur, and I would call him also entrepreneur of an idea. And this idea is objectivism. I hope you guys are familiar uh, what objectivism is. If not, uh, go to aynrand.org and quickly do some reading. Uh, hello, Dr. Brook, how are you? I'm good. How about you, Tomek? Uh, I'm good. I'm good here in Poland. It's quiet. Good. The weather is heavy. I think we're going to have some storms tonight, but oh, I'm safe. Uh, no riots. That's Where good. The sun is shining in Puerto Rico. I'm in Puerto Rico. The sun is shining. I was just came back from the beach. Uh, uh, no riots, some demonstrations, but nothing too bad. Um, <laughs> and overall, a beautiful, beautiful day today. Yes, I'm a bit jealous. So, guys, I have some base questions uh, submitted to me uh, before in some comments in various groups that I was posting this event to. Uh, sure. So I have some questions, but I'm always uh, welcomed uh, from you uh, to post questions in chat, either here or on YouTube. Uh, well, you can you can press raise hand, and if you, you are you seem decent person with a name, I may let you in on on a voice and a camera. Mm. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, usually if people could put on their cameras. That's always nice. It's always nice to see you guys. I mean, I can I can put you all on one screen. Like you are uh, all welcome to to be seen here. We have 27 people right now uh, on Zoom and eight on YouTube. Uh, you know, I, I guess like you were not born objectivist, object an objectivist. Uh, there was some way uh, for you, some path. Uh, to get into these uh, ideas and to agree with them. What was uh, the biggest problem you personally faced with objectivism? The biggest problem I faced? Biggest idea, something hard, difficult for you to chew and agree with. Well, I mean, there, were, there were a lot of things that were hard to understand, but I wouldn't say they were a problem of, of embracing objectivism. I, I don't know. I... Um, to me, once I read Atlas Shrugged, um, and so so the biggest problem while reading Atlas Shrugged was to uh, to embrace egoism, to to reject altruism, to really um, internalize this idea of it was okay to live for myself. It was, my life was the standard. That was a real revolution for me, and really hard uh, to integrate and to absorb given how I was raised, given the philosophy of everybody I knew around me, given the philosophy of everybody I talked to. Um, and I'd say the things that were most difficult for me to um, get rid of, right, uh, particularly on the emotional level. So intellectually, I understood a lot. But emotionally, it took me years and years and years to get rid of those. So first, altruism, which is really hard. To, to really get rid of from every system that you have, right? Because it's it's so ingrained in all of us. Uh, it, it's so much part of the culture. And I think most of us don't even know uh, completely. And you have to be very self-aware when altruism is kind of eating away at you, preventing you from being happy, uh, preventing you from making the right decisions. So altruism is big. For me, it was also nationalism collectivism. Um, you know, I, I grew up in Israel and collectivism was the thing and, uh, and um, nationalism was the thing. And uh, it took me a long time to get rid of that, to integrate that out of my system. I, and, and, you know, as part of that, uh, there was a period where I, uh, I served in the Israeli army after I'd already become an, an objectivist. So I had to serve in the Israeli army while I was integrating out of believing in nationalism and collectivism and dying for your country or whatever. So it was, it was particularly challenging. I think, I think it took me years to get rid of the nationalism, collectivism, altruism, um, you know, those three. And, uh, and then the, the challenge was just to understand the ideas, to see how they integrated together, to see how they connected. 
I studied the philosophy slowly. I mean, I know people who just immerse themselves in it and they try to eat up everything. I couldn't find the book. So it took me a long time to, it took me a while to read and I read slowly. And so for me, it was a years long, um, you know, process. It wasn't something where I read Atlas Shrugged and I read everything else. And within six months, I was completely educated in objectivism. I don't completely trust anybody who does that completely. Um, because it takes a long time to integrate these ideas, uh, particularly when you're young. And the fact is, when you're young, you're ignorant. You don't know anything. I didn't know anything. And uh, so I had nothing to connect the ideas to. And knowledge requires massive integration and massive concretization uh, with, with concrete from reality. It requires real knowledge of the world. And, and again, that's another reason um, it took me years to really integrate the philosophy. So I and hope right that now, answers. And now, right now, you would say you're like 100% objectivist. Like there is everything in principles that you agree with. Or yeah, I agree with all the principles. I don't, I wouldn't say it would be, it would be wrong of me to say that I understand everything 100% and I, uh, and I completely integrated everything 100%. There's still whole areas in the philosophy that I don't that I'm not an expert in, that I haven't completely integrated. I've integrated the principles, but do I know, do I understand everything she says in Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology? No. Um, do I uh, understand fully certain, you know, every time I put it this way, every time I read an essay by Ayn Rand and I am blown away by how much I don't yet understand. But, you know, for example, last year I did a whole session on Romantic Manifesto at OCON, uh, the Objectivist Conference that the Ayn Rand Institute puts on every summer. And uh, I, so I read, reread the Romantic Manifesto. And there's so much there. And it's so deep. And it's so um, different than anything else, uh, you know. And she integrates philosophy, psychology, and, and of course, art all in these essays. And no, I mean, there's a lot I still don't completely understand. I kind of get, I don't disagree, but I can't say, yes, I really understand it. I can teach it now. That's the standard for understanding, by the way. When you can teach something, you understand it. Or can you, when you write about something, you understand it. Until you teach it on or write on it, you think you understand it, but try try to write an essay on uh, why egoism is the right is the right approach to to ethics, and have somebody edit it, so have somebody critique it, so that it's real, so it's convincing. Or, or teach a class, you know, get some friends and do a little seminar on it, and suddenly you discover that you don't quite know how to explain certain aspects of it, and that's that's the that's that means you don't completely understand it, or you can't give the right examples. A lot of teaching. And a lot of explaining is giving examples. And you need to have examples for everything that you know, do you? So those are the kind of, so there's a lot I don't know yet still. And there's a lot I'll never know because I'm not that interested. Do I, do I care that I don't know the, every aspect of the epistemology? A little bit. It would be nice if I knew it. Do I care enough to devote huge amounts of time to studying it? No, it's not. It doesn't affect my life enough. I, I'm an egoist. Every minute of my life counts. I'm only going to focus on the thing that add value. And I know the epistemology enough so that I can live my life and do my thing and do what I do uh, well enough. So, Well, guys, I'm still waiting for uh, questions in both chats. Uh, thank you, Yaron, for this. Uh, well, we are about to answer some criticism. I mean, you are. I'll try to moderate it. Well, uh, and I'm yeah. sure during your during your... I don't know, 30 years long career as an like objectivist intellectual, 25, um, something no, like that. 25. 25, I wasn't an intellectual before then. So yeah, 20, but... really formally as an objectivist intellectual, I'd say 20. I started, <laughs> I started late, you know, and I, you know, and I think to be an intellectual, you, ha you know, as an, as, you have to get there, right? It takes a long time. I, you know, uh, not everybody who knows objectivism is automatically an intellectual. Not everybody who argues objectivism is automatically an intellectual. You have to know a lot. So probably 20, maybe 22 years, not, not much more than that. I've been speaking about objectivism, 
probably the first lectures on objectivism I ever gave was 1997 or 8, so 22, 23 years ago. That's it. I've been studying objectivism. I read Atlas Shrugged. Now you're going to hold them. I read Atlas Shrugged 43 years ago. But it took me 20 years before I ever gave a talk. I mean, a formal talk on, 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 on objectivism. I know because we organized a lot of talks with you. You told me that uh, your favorite part of the meeting is the Q and A session. Yes, you are quite like confrontal guy. You like to answer criticism, Absolutely. but you, I love to watch them as well. What is the one that comes the most often? The question after your talks. Well, it depends on the audience, right? So if it's an audience, my favorite audience is an audience of virgins, uh, which means an audience that's never heard these ideas before, right? That's my favorite audience. And I, my guess is nobody here is a virgin in that respect. Um, and the, the, the most common question there is, uh, you know, I've said this before many times, is what about the poor? What about the poor here? What about the poor there? It's not, how do I live an egoistic life? What about altruism? What about this? It's never about ethics. It's always about, what about the poor? Um, so that's the question I get the most from, I'd say, virgin audiences. The, quite, the two, I was thinking about this before doing this, because of course, uh, I hope most of you are from Poland. It's, it's hard to tell. It looks like a mixed group, but quite a few of you for, are Polish. Um, so I was thinking, what's the most common questions I get in Poland? And I'd say in Polish, the audiences Tomek has supplied to me, because uh, most of the audiences are being Tomek audiences. I guess the two, two themes, right? Uh, around the questions I get in Poland. One is, but what about God? Uh, so uh, so can, we, can we be capitalist and Catholic at the same time? And the second is about, why do we need governments? You know, are they anarchists? So, and that I get from all non-virgin audiences, the anarchy question, it's always there, libertarians everywhere, no matter where in the world. So I'd say religion, uh, in, in Poland, it's always religion and anarchy. Um, and, uh, virgin audiences, it's, uh, it's, uh, what about the poor? What other audiences? Um, what other questions do I get? Yeah, it, you know, that's what comes to mind right now. And maybe there is some that annoys you the most. Some criticism <laughs> that you can understand, you know. You know what annoys me the most. Well, what annoys me the most? Capitalism. Yeah, the anarchists annoy me the most. There's no question about that. <laughs> I mean, I love some of them. You know, it's it's not that it's personal, but it's like, and I again, I don't want to insult because there are probably a few anarchists there. I just find anarchy. I, I find anarchy such a ridiculous idea. I really do. I mean, it, this is not meant to insult. I find it such a ridiculous that it's like really. You know, really, what do you see here? What is it? What, what intrigues you about this? And I know there's some really serious people and some, some really smart people and some real people I respect who are anarchists. So, I, so I'm not saying that it can't be done. But to me, the immediate thing that comes in my mind is, really? I mean, anyway. <laughs> uh, would you like to take the criticism personal? or about Ayn Rand, or about Ayn Rand Institute, maybe? Or just philosophy? No, no, we can do everything. So if people want to criticize me, that's fine. <laughs> Institute, Ayn Rand, everything. You know, every, well, this is an open open forum, right? Go for it. OK, now my, my first chapter is personal. Just, One, just it has to be respectful. It can't be like you're a, a da, 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 da. Just, just something, with, you know, in a respectful way. Okay, so I will try to uh, paraphrase it, not quote okay. it. <laughs> Sometimes I just have topics to, to, to move, so it's uh, coming out of my head. But uh, don't you think, because many people, uh, I mean, for sure one person, and I heard it uh, a few times, uh, see you as some kind of like a grumpy, angry man. <laughs> some people say that, oh, Ayn Rand used to be the same way. Yep. So, uh, well, does it mean more happiness in objectivism? And aren't you worried that it maybe makes a bad PR? Or maybe, it, I don't know, 
what do you say about this? Maybe. I mean, maybe it's bad PR. It's, it's hard to tell. I don't think of myself as a grumpy old man. I don't consider myself old or grumpy. Um, I, I think people who know me would never think of me as grumpy. Um, I'm a happy, I'm happy. I live a happy life. Uh, as I said, I just, I, you know, life is good and my life is in particular good. Uh, you know, so I'm not grumpy at all. The problem is that I care. I'm passionate and I really, really care about my life, about other people's lives, about the world, about the state of the world. So I come across as grumpy because I get angry because, you know, and I think this is true of Ayn Rand. I don't think Ayn Rand was grumpy, but she came across as grumpy because she cared and she cared about the world around us. And, and I often say in my shows, I hate being so negative because I'm not negative at all in my life. Right. I don't live a negative life. I don't think in terms of that negative. But the fact is, when I do a show, so for example, I give you an example. If I do a show on my podcast about art, about how wonderful art is, about how much I enjoy art, about the meaning of art and so on, like five people watch it. And if I do a show about how Trump is a complete and utter idiot, maniac, moron, I think is a technical word, then a thousand, you know, two, three thousand people watch it. And if I do a show about how evil the left is, then 5,000 people watch it, right? So many, many more people watch me when I'm grumpy. <laughs> so the market signal is, you know, attack the positives people are not interested in. Now, again, I, you know, I don't, the fact is that I get angry at the state of the world. I get angry at people. You ask me about questions I hate. I guess the other question I hate the most other than the anarchists are the Trump questions. Um, because again, it's to me like Trump is so obviously bad that it upsets me when people don't see it. Um, but it's, um, so I don't know. I, you, know I, you know, I don't know what to say about it. I, I, I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to not be angry and upset when I'm dealing with issues that are angry and upset. Unfortunately, those people who make that critique have probably not seen uh, my shows where I talk about art or I talk about sex or I talk about love and uh, um, those shows I'm smiling and having a good time and I'm not grumpy at all um, but they are oriented people who think I'm grumpy are probably oriented towards wanting to hear politics and in politics there's nothing good there's nothing good to say about politics anywhere in the world so you know so it's 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 a consequence of caring and being emotional and, and being passionate, which I am. So you think the uh, same applies to Ayn Rand? Because some of them could see her in TV interviews and say, come on, she's talking about happiness. She doesn't look like a happy person. Oh, I think she was a happy person. And people who knew her, I didn't know her, say she was a happy person. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, um, I don't know how many of you have ever done television. But when you do television, you're sitting in front of a camera. There's a spotlight on you. Somebody's asking you questions. You have to answer them like that. Now, Ayn Rand was, was a genius, but she's still in the spotlight having to answer questions really, really quickly. Television is more, in a sense, more intimidating, much more intimidating than um, a live audience. Uh, she, I don't think, uh, you know, and, 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 and so she's not smiling and jumping around. And, and, the, and the questions are always hostile. Right. Nobody ever asks a nice, friendly, wonderful questions. Right. They're usually hostile when she's describing a philosophy once in a while. She'll smile on camera. But I smile a lot. I don't know what people are talking about. So, I, yes, I think Ayn Rand came across as grumpy because she cared and she was passionate because most of the questions related to negative stuff. I don't think it was because she in her personal life was grumpy. And I certainly Again, anybody who knows me will tell you I am the opposite of a grumpy person in, in personal life. I'm calm. I'm relaxed. I'm laid back. I, I almost never raise my voice. Uh, but, it, on, 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 but on radio, I raise my voice a lot. And in a bar, I raise a lot, my voice a lot. But in like to my wife uh, or, or to friends or hanging out, whatever, I'm the opposite of grumpy. Yeah, maybe we should go and do some, you know, 
uh, YouTube video from Yaron regular life. He showed, look, he's not grumpy. Uh, no, because I don't really care that people think I'm grumpy. I mean, I, I guess there's a marketing issue, but, but the marketing issue is solved you know, by, I think, self-selection. I think people who watch both the positive and negative stuff that I do see both sides. And I think that the people who just focus on politics get just the politics. And in politics, I'm grumpy as hell. Well, you said that being grumpy is, as I understand it, uh, kind of your strategy to reach audience uh, in your podcast, right? No, it's, it's not. It's not a strategy. It's who I am when those kind of issues are raised. And I raise my voice because I'm passionate. I, I, I talk about negative things because that's what's happening in the world. Um, if things started talking, you know, getting bad, oh, if there were people I could get excited about uh, in the political world, then I think I would be a lot less grumpy. But, it's, a uh, topic. it's a topic. If we talk about, when I talk about egoism, I don't think I'm grumpy. Okay, am I grumpy okay. now? I mean, you tell me, maybe I come across as grumpier than I think I am. Well, uh, I don't see it yet. Uh, okay. <laughs> Yaron, you've been CEO of We haven't got the animus yet, so I haven't become grumpy yet. I'm waiting for their questions. Uh, <laughs> Are you satisfied with the effectiveness of the Ayn Rand Institute? Considered how long it exists and how, how much budget does it have? Well, satisfied is a, uh, you know, is a loaded term. No, I'm never satisfied. Um, I'd like us to do more. I'd like us to be more effective. I'd like to figure it out. But am I satisfied that we do everything we can do and everything we know how to do? Yes. Am I satisfied with the results? No. So, uh, you know, every few years, every few months, we do a strategy session, try to figure out what are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? What could we do, we do better? Uh, and we constantly try to improve and try to do better. But it's very easy for people to be on the sidelines and look at it and think they know how to change the world. And if only the Institute did A or if only the Institute B, usually these are things that we've done in the past and failed. And people don't know, even know we've done them in the past. And other times, the stuff that we thought about and decided not to do for a variety of reasons. But I am satisfied that we, that the best thinkers in the world about how to spread objectivism, how to get the ideas out there into the culture, are on the job trying to do it. I'm not satisfied with the results because I don't think either we have come up with the right formula, and I'm quite ready to accept the fact that we haven't, or this is the culture and, and, and this is the best that we can do. And I don't know what the actual answer to that is. And that's why we keep trying. We keep moderating. We keep changing. We keep instituting new programs. We keep bringing new people on board. Uh, but, but the strategy, I think the strategy is the right strategy. And, and look, um, never has there been an institute. I mean, literally never has there been an institute dedicated to changing the world philosophically. Never has there been an institute dedicated to changing the world philosophically. So everything we're doing, we're doing for the first time. Everything we're doing in terms of impact, we don't know exactly what the impact is going to be and how successful it's going to be. We have no sense of what the timeline should be if we were perfect or what the timeline could be. Um, this is the most, I think, the most difficult thing in the world. I can't think of a more challenging, difficult, fun, but challenging and difficult thing to do than try to change the world philosophically, not politically, not scientifically, philosophically. So the underlying premise of everything. Um, and go up against religion, go up against altruism, go up against nationalism, go up against collectivism, go up against mysticism of all kinds. I mean, nobody's ever done that, ever. I mean, there was no, in the Enlightenment, there was no institute for the Enlightenment. There was no John Locke Institute. So even the Enlightenment, which was less radical than we are, didn't have an institute trying to do it. Right? Um, there was no Kantian Institute uh, on the flip side. Right? So... It's hard. And, and I know a lot of young people think, oh, this is going to be easy. And I, I thought that when I was younger. 
um, and before I tried to do it, uh, but it's much harder than you think. Well, but you can notice, and you also mentioned that, that uh, trivializing the message and uh, making it simpler or easier to, to digest for regular people, for society, uh, can be more effective. You say that you have more, uh, more audience when you, when you talk about certain topics. Uh, so some people but can understand. Standard, but is that the standard of success? That is, is the size of audience the standard of success? I, and for whom? Right? I don't, th I don't think it is because the size of audience you need to change your culture is, is millions of people and many of those millions committed to the ideas. You need thousands of people fully committed to the ideas, millions of people accepting the ideas. And how do you get there? Do you get there by, you know, one person having a podcast? Do you get there by having a million, a, a thousand Iran's with podcasts and public intellectuals? Do you get there by having five philosophers? Those are the kind of questions you, you need. And I, I believe you need all of the above. And until you have, just, just for the sake of it, until you have a hundred real phil objectivist philosophers who know this philosophy inside out, and you have 10,000 popularizers like me, or, or a thousand, you're not gonna be successful. So in a Thank sense, you. my argument is, the most important thing you can do is train intellectuals at the highest level, philosophers, and at the level what, where I present ideas, because that will pay off in 20 to 30 years. Won't pay off tomorrow, because they're not gonna get the audience tomorrow. But in 20, 30 years, when they're in the culture and people are following them, that's when you get the payoff. All right. Uh, about Ayn Rand Institute relations or your relations to other groups, why are you so so like hateful towards libertarians when they seem to be the closest ally to your ideas? Well, I'm only hateful to some libertarians. There's some libertarians who I love, who are great, who I, who I support, who I've worked with, uh, who I've been on panels with, who I've done all kinds of things. Um, the ones I hate tend to be the ones who tend to be the rabid anarchists, the people who believe that anarchism is a solution. And as I said, in my debate with an anarchist in Poland, I consider anarchism, and you can include so-called anarcho-capitalism in that, I believe that it's as bad as communism and fascism. I believe that it is the devil. It is really, really, really destructive to human life. I know I've just offended a bunch of you. I can see it on Sebastian's face, but that's the problem of video, right? But that is the reality of what I believe, right? I think anarchy leads to nothing. And I've said this dozens of times. I think anarchy leads to nothing by bloodshed, destruction, uh, bloodshed and destruction. And I think ultimately it leads inevitably to authoritarianism. So I hate anarchy. I, I hate that set of ideas. And I'm hostile to particularly intellectuals who try to spread those ideas. And I've tried to interact as little as possible with them. But I don't, I don't hate other libertarians. I mean, I've, uh, there are many libertarians, uh, uh, economists, uh, political scientists who, again, I think do good work. Some people at Cato, not everybody. Some people at uh, Fee. Uh, I work with Fee. I've worked with Cato. I've worked with, you know, lots of different organizations over the years uh, on specific issues, on, um, on, you know, on broad issues that they were good at. But the, the, A, the idea of a big tent, I think, um, dilutes the philosophy to the point where it's meaningless. And it, as I said, I find anarchy offensive. So I, I'm not interested in being in a big tent with people I find offensive. So I think that, uh, so I have no, I don't reject, you know, I speak to libertarian groups all the time. I speak to Students for Liberty. I speak to uh, uh, Federalist Society, to Adam Smith societies, to all over the place. So I don't consider myself hostile to libertarianism. I consider myself hostile to anarcho-capitalists and I consider myself a hostile to the idea of a big tent. I think the idea of a big tent is bad. Uh, but regarding the anarchism, uh, I think that maybe those people maybe just don't understand it yet. They don't necessarily need to be uh, evil, evil persons, right? I've never said they're evil. I think some of them are evil. I think if you're, you know, you, you, you know, Hope, a few others, 
um, I, I, I would consider immoral. But um, no, I mean, particularly young people, I don't consider young anarchists evil. I think when you're young and you're still trying out ideas and anarchy has a certain logic to it and a certain rationalistic, you know, logic to it, beauty to it or whatever, um, sense to it. Uh, yeah, I'm, I, you know, it's why I, I talk to people who are anarchists, why I try to, you know, uh, 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 convince them otherwise. Um, but, but yes, we, you know, if you're an anarchist in your 40s, something's wrong. Well, but still, uh, we don't see you cross-posting much with uh, some libertarians. Like, I think you once told me uh, that you wouldn't, or maybe Tom Woods told me that you would never appear on his show. You I will never be on Tom Woods' show. No. Why? Because he's over 40 and he's, a, and he's an anarchist. I mean, that's it. If you're over 40 and an anarchist, I'm not sitting on stage with you. you you're, well, but... you're a bad person. It, it, this is not, these are not neutral ideas. And I said before, I'm passionate. I take ideas seriously. I take ideas seriously on how they impact your life and my life, my life primarily. Anarchy is a destructive ideology. I'm willing to tolerate it when you're young, because when you're young, you're still trying to figure out what's true and what's not. And you're experimenting with all kinds of ideas and you're trying to figure it out. At some point, my, into my tolerance disappears and it goes away. And I'm not tolerant of anti-life ideas from people who should know better. And Tom Wood should know better. Now, it's not just that he's an anarchist. It's that he's, um, you know, he's, he's part of the Mises Institute, which is pro or semi-pro slavery in the South, right? It was anti the Civil War. That is, that has, you can find articles there, underlying racist agendas, not that Tom Woods is, but the organization he's affiliated with is, that are pacifists, which I consider, you know, nutty. The pacifists, they're, they're anti-American in foreign policy, every sin in the world. They're pro Hugo Chavez. It's, it's why I hate Ron Paul. Hate Ron Paul, not just dislike Ron Paul. It's because he's pro Hugo Chavez, pro uh, Maduro's regime. So I, I will not deal with people who are over the certain age, let's say 40, who advocate ideas that I consider fundamentally anti-life and who might be confused with objectivism. So people like Tom Woods, Murray Rothbard, anybody affiliated with the Von Mises Institute. I mean, I find those ideas worse than the worst ideas of the left to logic and to some extent because these people claim to be Ayn Rand fans. They claim to be pro-liberty when they're exact opposite. They're anti -liberty. Now I become grumpy, right? Now I'm living up to my reputation. Um, it's, it, it really is, um, there is a fundamental philosophical but not just philosophical in an abstraction. There's a fundamental difference between the kind of uh, libertarian, the, 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 the anarcho-capitalist of Tom Woods, and objectivism. These are philosophies that are completely opposite. They happen to have some agreement on economics. But with all due respect, economics is not that important. And I'm an economist, and it's not that important. But they have no relationship when it comes to morality. They have no relationship in epistemology. They have no relationship with metaphysics, and they don't have any relationship in, in politics because the one's an anarchist and the one, one believes in actually limited government. So, and, and, and no relationship in aesthetics. So in 90% of the philosophy, we're opposed. And you want me to be their friend because of 10%. But I have more in common with leftists than with the anarcho-capitalists when it comes to the totality of their ideas. There Some is, there is two issues with that and uh, issues. Aaron, uh, Aaron points out that don't you think that a more good would do just go and debate him? You don't have to endorse him. And the second point is debating that- Debating somebody, let me just finish. Debating something is an endorsement. Debating somebody is a sanction. I, you know, I, there's, and there's no reason to debate him. That's, that's the bigger problem. A narco, you know, and again, I'm going to insult some of you, but tough. A narco capitalism is not a legitimate ideology. It's not a legitimate set of ideas. It's not worthy of debate. It is a fringe, marginal, insignificant portion of the world is an alco-capitalist. And most people grow out of it relatively quickly, right? 
So again, they're not that many over 40. And it's just not worth debating. I mean, I did that debate in Poland. I've done it once. Anybody can go and watch it. And if, if you don't, you know, if, if that's not good enough, then, you know, you're going to have to figure it out yourselves. Yaron hated this debate. He didn't want to come. Uh, I was not sure if even this is going to happen. I mean, it, since then, since then, Yaron mentions this debate like every time. time. So I guess, I guess. I, I did guess. hate it. And, I, and, and it, there's a sense in which I'm glad I didn't. There's a sense in which I feel a little dirty for doing it. I mean, he was there defending, you know, sex with children. I mean, or, or he couldn't argue against it. I mean, I can't think of anything more where I want to wash my hands and stay away. Uh, you can check the recording and at objectivism.pl. It was, uh, yeah, I don't remember the title. I will post it in the, in the event afterwards. Easy to find. All you do is do Iran, Iran Brook Anarchy, and that's the first hit you get on YouTube. All right. And if you want to support this uh, not so grumpy man in headphones, you can go to yaronbrookshow.com and check all the. Here's a uh, question Adam asked, so I might as well answer it because it's related. He says, Couldn't you make the same argument against objectivism? Fringe only small portion of people in the world are objectivists. True, absolutely true. And I'm always surprised why people agree to debate an objectivist. Um, you know, and, and I always say, when somebody says, I don't want to debate you, you're on, I would say, I understand him completely. He's got, nothing to he's got nothing to gain by debating me. And I don't blame people for not debating me. I go, yeah, I mean, why, let's say, I don't know, Steven Pinker. Why doesn't Steven Pinker agree to appear on stage with me? Because he's got nothing to gain and everything to lose by it. So I am, objectivism is fringe and small. Absolutely. I happen to be in that fringe and small. If I'm going to go and debate, if I want to grow the movement, I'm not going to grow the movement by going to another fringe and small and, and even less reputable group than objectivists, which is the anarcho-capitalist. I would much rather go to big groups where I can get lots of people like leftists and conservatives. And then I can own people in the middle. And then I can get a lot of people. But why would I go being fringe to another fringe little group and, and, and argue about minutia at, in front of, you know, 17 people who, who already made up their mind, right? I would much rather go to big audiences and big groups and debate big issues. Um, and, and that happens to be the left and the right. It, one of the problems that I find with libertarians is they love to argue among themselves. Who is the perfect audience for, for you and objectivists to go and if, if not uh, Tom Woods' uh, audience of the podcast? Well, I can tell you the audience that has been most successful, the appearance that I made, that has been most successful for me by far. It's not even close, right? In terms of subscribers, followers, all of that, is when I first appeared on Dave Rubin. Now, in those days, Dave Rubin's audience has changed. But in those days, who was Dave Rubin's audience? It was left, science and reason respecting. That's who the audience, my ideal audience is not religious, Respect, right, reason, and science, tilting a little left. That's my best audience. And it's always been my best audience. The problem is getting them in the room because they hear Ayn Rand and they run, or they hear capitalism and they run. The beauty of somebody like Dave Rubin is you could get in and they were listening to him. And we had this great conversation, which turned, I've got more people have come to me and said, wow, I started reading Ayn Rand because of your appearance on Dave Rubin than anything else I've ever done. It's people like that. Uh, you know, I would much rather go on Dave Rubin's show than Tom's Woods show. Tom Woods show, everybody who listens to Tom Woods, not everybody, 70% of people who listen to Tom Woods already know I exist. I probably listened to something I've already done and decided, you know, to dismiss me and go with Tom Woods. What do I gain by going on Tom Woods versus going on, you know, if I could go on Joe Rogan's show, that would be great. You know, get exposed to millions of new people, uh, people who are generally thinking, generally listening, generally engaged in the culture, that is like a million times better than going to another libertarian event. You know, people, you know, uh, Mark Skousen wants me to come to Freedom Fest. And Freedom Fest is wonderful, but again, it's this, I want virgins. I, for those of you who don't know what I mean by virgins, people who've never been exposed to their ideas, people who are new, people who maybe know a little bit, but don't know that much. That's, look, I'm not a philosopher. So my job is not to take people who know something about objectivism and make them really 
deep intellectuals. My job is to expose people who don't know much about the ideas to the ideas in a legitimate, interesting, uh, legitimate, interesting way. And um, I think I'm good at that. I'm not good at epistemology, as I said earlier. We have Patrick from Warsaw on uh, on on the camera with a question uh, about uh, some Michael Shermer critique of you, oh, uh, or vice versa. Patrick, hey. are you with us? Yeah, I've, I've become a Varsovian now. That's new. A what? Oh, you are in Warsaw. I'm a, a, your favorite Canadian Armenian living in Warsaw. Let's do it that way. Go on with your question. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. So Tom asked me to oh, find the questions. Listen, I'm, I'm, I've got a like more serious one, but I also have one that's going to piss you off. So we'll do the piss you off one because that's the most fun one. Um, See, I recently, uh, and, yeah. then, and, then, and then people say I'm grumpy, right? My, my friendly audience, I know Patrick, my friendly audience <laughs> asks me questions just to piss me off. And then people are going to say, See, your run's grumpy. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't have fun. Like. I mean, as long as you answer with a smile, I think you're okay. Oh, yeah. All right, so um, I came across one of your videos. Uh, you were replying to Michael Shermer's critique of Ayn Rand. And um, so oh, you're feel... very generous to call it what he said a critique of Ayn Rand. Oh, well, hang on a second. See, I feel like you straw manned him because I actually just read his chapter on, uh, on objectivism. Yeah. And I was uh, the, responding the... to his chapter, I was responding to what he said on Dave Rubin's show. Uh, gotcha. Okay. So yeah, well, so the, the, the point of the chapter was uh, he, he, first of all, he mentions many times he's, uh, he's very um, friendly towards the idea of, of objectivism. He was just explaining how rational people can also turn into a cult-like atmosphere. And he gives specifically the example of uh, Nathaniel Brandon mm -hmm. and uh, how Ayn Rand kicked him out of the movement, uh, banished him, you know, basically had his writings uh, scrubbed away and uh, discourage others from having a relationship with him. So can you address those specific points? Uh, I'd, I'd like to know a little bit more about that rather than- I talked about that. Around. I talked about that in my response. So in the video, but, but sure. I mean, it's interesting. It's interesting that libertarians come up with this, right? Um, do you know public choice theory? Anybody know public choice theory? You know, uh, Buchanan and um, uh, I forget the other guy, big, big public choice thinkers. It's, it's, it's an interesting, Part of economics, free market economics, there's a, there's a lot of value I think you can get. Flawed in certain ways, but a lot of value you can get out of it. The two guys who invented public choice theory um, stopped talking to each other at some point. Refused to refer to each other. The two, they invented it together. And they didn't talk to each other until they died. And they hated each other. And they talked all kinds of smack about each other and, and all this stuff. Nobody cares. Nobody says public choice is a cult because the two founders didn't talk to each other and didn't like each other and resented one another. The same I can give you with every single intellectual movement. There is not a single intellectual movement where the leadership is not fractured, is not disagreed, is not fought, is not ex ex so-called excommunicated people. That's what happens when you take ideas seriously. When you take ideas seriously and you engage in intellectual battle, an intellectual, when people betray what you think is the truth, you take that very, very seriously, and you don't want to have anything to do with them. And, you know, I have people in my life that I've walked away from, won't do anything with them. I have people in my business life that I do that. Imagine if somebody in your business life, you, you, you own a business, and you're in partnership, and you think your partner's committed fraud. Should you stay tolerant of them and keep going to business with you? Well, of course not. You're going to walk away, kick him out, never talk to them again. Now, imagine you're running and you're engaged in intellectual activism. And for whatever reason, you believe that one of your partners engaged with you is committing fraud. Whether that fraud is intellectual or whether that fraud is financial or whether that fraud just means they're lying to you. Now, because we're intellectuals and we've got, we want to change the world together, you're supposed to forgive them and be nice to them and tolerate them. Why? No businessman would ever do that. Nobody in their private life would ever do that. So here's Nathaniel Brandon, lying time. And if you read the best book about why what Ayn Rand did to Nathaniel Brandon was a hundred times justified is Nathaniel Brandon's book about, I forget the name of it. And I, I you know, I, you know, about his relationship with Ayn Rand and about the whole thing. Cause he comes off in that book as a world-class jerk asshole and, and, a, and a major liar and deceiver. Right. And he says in the book, I was pretending to be an objectivist when I really wasn't. 
I was pretending to agree at stuff that I didn't agree. See, he was a fraud. He committed fraud. He lied to Ayn Rand. He was, he, I think, he, he set the movement back by decades. I think he created an environment within objectivism that looked cultish uh, and, and I think hurt the, the movement moving forward by creating a, a, a you, everybody has to be the same, everybody, you know, it, kind of a cultish atmosphere. And she discovered this and she kicked him out. I mean, why would anybody object to that? And by the way, note this, and this is, again, this is absurd. None of his essays were taken out of books that she wrote. So in Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, and the Virtue of Selfishness, they're essays by Nathaniel Brandon. Nobody took those out. Nobody demanded that they be taken out. He wasn't wiped away from the objectivist history. He's right there. So, well, I mean, there is a preface to the virtue of selfishness. What's that? There is a preface. Uh... Yeah, she says, this guy is not associated with me anymore. <laughs> Why is that unusual? And he later on does these uh, uh, talks on the dangers of, you know, the dangers of objectivism, uh, the harm that you get from reading the novels. I, I listened to one of those talks in my early 20s, and I thought it was ridiculous then. I mean, I wouldn't even dare listen to it today because I think it would be absolutely absurd. But he, he then, he, he becomes weird afterwards. He does all kinds of things with men's groups and all kinds of weird stuff. Why not write a little preface saying, while he was affiliated with me then, he's not affiliated with me now. That's completely logical, completely rational. It's, it's every intellectual movement in human history has done the same, if not much, much more than that. And in every element in life if your wife cheats on you you walk away right i mean in every part of human life we separate this idea that in objectivism we should be kumbaya but in everybody everywhere else it's okay to fight is bizarre to me right so yeah if if if, if it turns out that one of you steals money from me i'm not talking to you again and if that shocks you because we're in the same movement then you don't understand the movement so, no, I don't think that's an honest critique. I don't think that's an intellectual critique. I don't think that's, yes, when people who pretend to be objectivists articulate ideas that are not consistent with objectivism, we go and say, this person is no longer consistent with objectivism. If somebody affiliated with the Ayn Rand Institute then says, I don't agree with the mission of the Ayn Rand Institute, I think the mission should be different, we say, great, go do, go do it somewhere else. Right? Just like in business, if I have a partner, I mean, I, I run a hedge fund. I have three other partners. If one of my partners says, I don't like the way this partnership is run, I, I'm going, great, go start your own. You know, leave the business, go start your own business. There's no difference. And it, it's curious to me how we have a different way of thinking, you know, the, 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 we automatically assume that if, you're, if, if you stick to principles in intellectual pursuit, you're a cult, if you stick to principles in your daily life or in your business life, that's fine. No, principles are principles. I don't want to deal with people I don't like. And since I'm the boss, I get to kick out people I don't like. Well, the allegations... I mean, of, like, uh, in a, of, not like in a deep sense, not just that it's superficially. Yeah. Well, the allegations of uh, the objectivist movement being cultish and sectish uh, were like they existed like 40 years ago, even, even, even with Rothbard. And since then, we had this thing. Yeah, but Rothbard, Rothbard, now you're getting me angry. Because Rothbard is the most cultish, disgusting, offensive guy out there. I mean, Rothbard was kicked out of Cato. Cato is like the ultimate in, in Big Ten, loving everybody. And they couldn't stand Rothbard. Rothbard, you know, isolated, you know, himself and fought with everybody. Think about the fact that the Koch brothers, who were like this with Rothbard in the 70s, you know, were like this with Rothbard post-70s. So he used Rothbard to critique Ayn Rand. Rothbard also admitted later in life that he lied about Ayn Rand, that he made stuff up about Ayn Rand in order to make his little cult much more exclusive, right? So, no, I don't, you know, you know, libertarians who are about as exclusive as anybody in terms of who they deal with, right? You know, let me give you an example. Tom Woods is an example. You, you raised Tom Woods before. And I hope this Q&A doesn't all turn over libertarians. 
Um, Devon Mises Institute, after 9-11, called me a bloodthirsty um, homicidal maniac. And that was some of the nicest comments about me, right? They wrote article about article about how I was crazy, stupid, and, and bloodthirsty. Now, I'm supposed to ignore that, and I'm supposed to just appear in Tom Wood's show as if nothing happened, as if we're good friends, as if we have a common agenda. I mean, that is bizarre. If somebody calls me a bloodthirsty maniac, unless they apologize and explain why, I'm never going to talk to them again. I mean, I'm not talking about an intellectual critique of my point of view. I'm talking about name-calling and, and a complete distortion of my point of view. I believe in, I, you know, I'm a human, I, I'm an egoist. I'm not going to go to my destroyers and say, sure, let's be friends. Because you happen to agree about 10%, you know, because I, I like your economics. Forget it. And the same thing about every aspect of this. If you undermine the philosophy, why do I want to be your partner? So, I, you know, if people think that if you stick to principles, and you require that other people affiliated with you stick to principles. If people think that's a cult, then they don't know what a cult is. They don't understand what a cult is. And they are, they are delusional. Um, you can't have a cult of independent thinkers. You can't have a cult that advocates for reason and thinking for yourself. But it's also true that every movement, including a movement of independent thinkers, is a movement that has standards and has criteria, and has principles. And it's not like we lynch anybody or, 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 or burn them at the stake. We say, if you think this, we don't have anything to do with you. Go cry to your mommy. You know, but that's what they do. They go, oh, the cult of objectivism. Give me a break. Grow up. You know, you don't agree with us. Have a spine. Accept that you don't agree with us. Go do your own thing. Somebody asked me a nice question so I can stop being grumpy. There is, I have a set of very Polish questions and actually asked by Polish audience. Okay. Uh, because I'm talking to you from Poland, you can always Patrick visit that. I, I, thought, I thought Patrick had more questions for me. Uh, well, I, I know what is his second question. I will maybe, when we go with the topics, I will uh, bring yeah. him back. Uh, why can't you accept, Jaron, that Polish nationalism is about freedom? Uh, I guess this uh, this somebody is uh, arguing about this with you over some podcasts or comments. Yeah, this so. is this is a, another one of the questions I always get in Poland because the Poland the Polish liberty movement is comprised of three types, and the, and there's overlap, right? Which is weird. Um, religionists, nationalists, and anarchists. <laughs> An objectivist. Not the whole movement, I'm kidding, but not the whole movement, but a big a big chunk of it. Um, and we have two objectivists, so please go follow Objectivism file. I will post links. Go on, Jeremy. Um, because nationalism and freedom are in contradiction. Uh, particularly the kind of nationalism that I think uh, the, 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 Poli the Polish nationalists advocate for. What is nationalism? It's an ism. It's an ism that says what? It's an ism that basically means the state is above the individual. The state is what's important. And the state, in the Polish context, is defined by certain borders and a certain type of person inside the borders. You know, a Pole, you know, he has a particular color skin and he has a particular genetic line and whatever, right? People who def are defined as Polish by genetics, not by citizenship. So I don't know if Patrick will ever be a real Pole for the nationalists, because he's Armenian from, I can't remember from where. But um, that is anti-individualism, and that is anti-freedom. It places, you know, um, uh, genetic lineage race as a primary, as a primary of evaluating something for the purpose of politics. Uh, Polish nationalism is anti-immigration. Um, Polish nationalism is placing the state above the individual. And that's the opposite of freedom. Freedom is about 
the, the sanctity of the individual. It is about, you know, you can, the only type of nationalism which would be legitimate is a nationalism that says we in these borders are fighting for respecting the individual and we will do whatever we can for the individual. It's like the original form of American nationalism that Ayn Rand talked about, but almost nobody believes in that form of nationalism. Nationalism for almost everybody is state above the individual and state defined not just in terms of borders, but in terms of genes. And that is the opposite of what it means to be an individualist. It's an opposite of what it means to be pro-freedom. It's the opposite of what it means to be pro-liberty. And if I could comment on that, I also think that Polish nationalism is not about freedom. This is wishful thinking. If you actually look out of the window and look, check the nationalists, no. Uh, however, if you are so against nationalism, why does Ayn Rand Institute spend vast amounts of resources and time on writing about few million Israelis and nothing on Hong Kong, Taiwan? Um, I would challenge anybody to look at my podcasts and uh, sum up the minutes that I've spent on Israel versus the minutes I've spent on Hong Kong. I'm sure I've spent more time on Hong Kong than on Israel. Um, but the main reason is Uh, is that Israel is a bastion of freedom in an area dominated by collectivism, mysticism, barbarism, and an area in which the West is in significant conflict. So it's not that Israel is an ideal state. It's not. And in my ideal world, there is no Israel. I don't believe in Israel. If there's no anti-Semitism, And uh, we all live in, a, in, in a laissez-faire capitalism. I don't believe in Israel. Israel shouldn't exist, right? Um, in, 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 so nobody at the Anwar Institute is an Israeli nationalist. Nobody in Israel believes in Israel above all else. Israel is in the context of the battle we in the West are fighting against I- 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 Islamic radicals, against Islamic terrorism. Israel is important. And after 9-11... After 9-11, that battle against Islam, Islamism became a big part of what we did at the Institute. Now, you could argue that it was, we put too much emphasis on it. I know people who think we too, put too little emphasis on it. I know people, you know, people disagree. I mean, you, there's nothing you can do about it. But the fact is that once that became a big issue, and I think 9-11 was a big issue, Israel played a big role in it because it's right smack in the middle of the Middle East. And it's the only free country in the Middle East. It's the only worthwhile country in the Middle East. And it becomes, it's the only U.S. ally in the Middle East. And, and that's why it becomes an issue. So I don't talk about Israel much on my show. Um, I left Israel, by the way, if you haven't noticed. I don't live there anymore uh, because I, I like America more than I like Israel. I'm an American patriot. I, I, I consider myself an American, not an Israeli. When people introduce me as an Israeli-American, I don't like that because I am an American first. Um, but if you're, gonna, if you're gonna attack Israel, I'm gonna come after you intellectually, right? If you're gonna attack, if you're gonna create a moral equivalency between Israel and its neighbors, I'm gonna come after you. Um, I have, in, 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 You know, I would rather live in Hong Kong than in Tel Aviv. I've, I've said that often. I've, I've considered, I mean, there was a period, you know, I've considered, I've never really considered moving to Hong Kong, but, but I love Hong Kong. Hong Kong is much more my spirit, but it's, it's not, you know, this, this notion that the Ayn Rand Institute is obsessed with Israel. The only reason we emphasize Israel is because of the context. And you can't ignore the context. Israel as a country is no worse and no better than France, Germany, Italy, you know, places in Europe. It's a mixed economy. You know, it has better elements to those countries and it has worse elements to those countries. Politically, it's very mixed. But in the context of the Middle East, it's a shining beacon. And in the context of the fight against terrorism, it's a shining beacon. By the way, most of my talks on Israel are very critical of Israel. But still, with you being Israeli, Ayn Rand and most of the VIPs around Ayn Rand Institute are Jewish. It seems quite suspicious. That's because 
you guys have collectivistic minds. Uh, instead of asking the question, what do these Jews do right that causes so many of them to become objectivists, you immediately assume there's some conspiracy, <laughs> right? And look, if we wanted to take over the world right now, we wouldn't start with objectivism. Because as somebody said, we're too small and too sidelines. You know, we, we'd start, you know, we take over, I don't know, something else. I mean, no, it's a stupid question. You know, it, it's not like Jews are conspiring to take over objectivism. It just happens that Ayn Rand happened to be Jewish in origin. She didn't care much about it. Nobody cares much about it. And it's never discussed. What difference does it make? It's only from a nationalist collectivist perspective. Does that even matter? Nobody ever within, nobody ever talks about it because nobody cares. I have a question from Betsy Spiher, if I... She's on, the, she's on video. Uh, Betsy, are you with us? You, you broke up, so say that again. I broke up. Yeah. Uh, well, I have a, I had a question from Betsy. Betsy, are you with us? Yes, yeah, uh, she is. You, should, you need to unmute yourself, and you can join okay. us on... Okay. Uh, I have a question about the Ayn Rand Institute activity. I've been an ARI supporter forever since it started. And I love the essay contest, which helped spread the reading of Ayn Rand's books. I donate to the book project. And I see ARI's mission as preserving, promoting, and teaching Ayn Rand's philosophy. But I have some reservations which I'd like you to address about the independent intellectual activities, some of the essays and the op-eds issued by ARI, because they're not related to and don't promote or preserve Ayn Rand. Let me give you an example. Um, recently, ARI had, uh, under New Ideal, published an essay by Elon Giorno, who's a friend of mine. And it was an excellent essay on foreign policy. But it never mentioned Ayn Rand. It never mentioned or emphasized her ideas such as individual rights or uh, egoism versus altruism or anything distinctly objectivist in the essay. And I think that this would have been a fine essay in a foreign policy journal, but I don't think it belongs in something done by ARI or... Um, so... So, so I, I get it. Yeah. So let me, this is the mission of the Ayn Rand Institute. I'm just going to read off the mission. ARI fosters a growing awareness, understanding, and acceptance of Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism in order to create a culture whose guiding principles are readers and rational self-interest, individuals of, and laissez-faire capitalism, a culture in which individuals are free to pursue their own happiness. The key here is fosters a growing awareness, understanding, and acceptance. That is our mission. That is stated on our website. That is it. Now the question is, what do you do in order to grow an awareness? And in my view, what you do to grow an awareness is not just Ayn Rand said this, Ayn Rand said that. You do that as well. But what you do is you cultivate good ideas based on her philosophy. And you get them out there. And look, everybody, when, when everybody reads Elon's essay, and I don't know which essay you're referring to, so I'm not going to get to the particulars of the essay because I can't remember it. And I... I a little bit doubt you, the way you've presented it uh, about it, because my, my suspicion is it's very much based on Ayn Rand's philosophy, even though it's not explicitly so. Um, it's on the Ayn Rand website. It's got Ayn Rand there and it's new ideal. This is what Ayn Rand intellectual. So the connection to Ayn Rand is not hidden. It's like when I go out and give a talk on capitalism and I never mention Ayn Rand, but my title is that I'm giving the talk on is chairman of the Ayn Rand Institute. Everybody makes that connection. Um, 
I think by del- one of the most important ways in which we can grow the awareness and understanding of Iron Man's ideas is by becoming world-class experts in our field, foreign policy for Elon, I'm over generalist, uh, uh, energy for Alex, right? Alex Epstein. Um, and then going out there and articulating these ideas in a coherent, you know, interesting, uh, uh, positive way that then people link up to Ayn Rand's ideas. And they say, wow, the Ayn Rand Institute or Ayn Rand was about this philosophy that has all these interesting applications. And look, you know, you can look at energy differently and you can look at foreign policy differently and you can look at these other things differently. And I, and I don't think you have to mention Ayn Rand in the essay and I don't think you have to quote Ayn Rand. You don't have to keep pounding that's, individual rights every that's single time. my issue. Okay, that's not my issue. My concern is, is that um, ARI's resources should be focused, sh- shouldn't, should be focused on Ayn Rand. For instance, this is, uh, this, I this write, is, uh, yeah, but this is okay, what we I write, I write, I write bo- uh, books having to do with applications of objectivism to everyday life. But I wouldn't want ARI subsidizing or promoting them because it's not Ayn Rand, it's me. And yep. the same thing with uh, independent thinkers. I think the, the, uh, what ARI should be doing is, su- is teaching at philosophy to the political commentators and to the people who will, would apply Ayn Rand's ideas to the culture but not actually do it. I think that's a job. For okay. Uh, so I get, I, I get that. And, and, and so let me, so we disagree on what Ayn Rand Institute should do. I mean, that's, that's just the reality, right? I, you know, this is the thing that if, if the, if it existed, if there was an opportunity in the world where the Ayn Rand Institute could train these people, could train the, the political thinkers, could train the foreign policy guys, could train like we trained Alex and train these people. And then they could go get jobs at universities, at Cato, you know, at think tanks, at these places, then great. And I, I would agree with you. That's what we should do. But the actual reality is, and, and, and uh, this is, and Ayn Rand talked about this. Ayn Rand talked about the fact. Somebody asked her, what would you do? I think it's in what one should do in the essay. She said, one of the things, but maybe not, maybe it's somewhere else, or maybe Leonard told me this or something, but, but this, is, this is the idea. The left trains their people and gets them jobs, the universities. The right today trains their people and puts them in all these think tanks that they've created for these people. We in objectivism should train our people and then abandon them. And then, but that's exactly what it is. We would abandon them because they can't get jobs in academia. And we've tried, we spent a lot of money on trying to do that. They cannot get jobs in other think tanks. Uh, Alex is unique in that he happens to be an entrepreneur and he can go do it himself, but that's unique. Not everybody is like that. The job of the Ayn Rand Institute, and, 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 and Ayn Rand said this, what we need is a, is, a, is, a, is a place where you can hire the people that you train. And that's exactly what we do at the Institute. I believe that that is the most important thing, the most important thing we can do to increase awareness of objectivism so that we don't come off cultishly, and, and narrowly, but do we actually have ideas? We, we can't just, we don't just quote Ayn Rand, we actually have ideas about things and we apply them. So I am very proud, and this is, and, and we're gonna have to leave it here because you know we should take other questions. I, but I'll leave it with this where we disagree. I am very proud of the people I've trained or we've trained. I'm very proud of Ilan writing on foreign policy and getting those words out. I wish, I wish I had 20 more people like that applying objectivism and writing out of the Institute about these issues. Um, because, I, because I, you know, ideally they would be out there in the world, but they, they're not going to make a living out there. And I, I want to support and I want to make sure that these people have a job and that they can. And I think that this is what it means to promote objectivism. What it means to promote objectivism is not to promote Ayn Rand. That's one aspect of it. But what it really means to promote objectivism, if your goal is to change the world, and my goal has always been to change the world. My goal has not been, and I, I told the board when I took over, my, I did not view my job as, prim- as exclusively to protect, to defend, to 
you know, preserve. My job was to change the world. To change the world, you have to apply, 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 apply. And that's what I did. If you remember right after 9-11, what did I do? I took Ayn Rand's ideas and applied them to 9-11 and applied them to foreign policy. And I went out there and, and hustled to do that. Now, you could argue that was bad, which is fine, or shouldn't have been the focus of the Institute. But, but that's how I view it. And I would love that there were, if there was somebody right now writing on the, on the riots and all of this stuff constantly and writing about politics and writing about all kinds of issues outside of politics, all, you know, science and all this other stuff. And people are going to disagree with stuff that the Ayn Rand Institute puts out. And I, there's no litmus test counter to the claims uh, that we're a cult. There's no litmus test. Uh, I know we probably we disagree on certain political issues. Betsy, nobody's kicking you out of the movie, uh, movement because we disagree about politics. It, it's, it's a movement where we're going to disagree on application. But I think if we can get the best minds using objectivism to apply these ideas, we come across as a movement. We come across as an ideology. We come across as something that's interesting. And I know, I mean, maybe this sounds a little, but other than Rand and Leonard, I don't think anybody's brought more people to Ayn Rand than just me talking. And that's because I, I apply objectivism in an interesting way. And I think that attracts people to Ayn Rand. I don't do it. My goal is not for them to follow you on. I, I mean, I'm not Ayn Rand. <laughs> I mean, I'm, you know, my goal is for them to read Ayn Rand. And I say that all the time. Go read Ayn Rand. That's this awareness. And a little bit of understanding, because I don't think I, I enhance understanding that much beyond what they read from Ayn Rand. My goal is to increase awareness. And I increase awareness by talking about Trump. You know, and, and some people don't like it that I talk about Trump, but that's, that's, the, that's the reality. You, you're move. muted. I can't hear uh, anything you're saying. Uh, well, I muted here because you said that it's, it, that's it, but let's unmute. Well, okay, let it just say something what and then about, we'll go on. Okay, what about having debates among objectivists sponsored by ARI over controversial topics. Yeah, we, we could do we could do that if there was if there were if there were you know if we could find equal partners if we could find people who were, who could stood up for that. I have no you know I debated Leonard on immigration, you know, and and and, and I'm happy to 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 do, you know if we find people with a disagreement and they're you know they're, they're worth debating, sure. I don't have any problem with that. And one of the reasons, if you remember, that when I debated, debated Leonard Peikoff on immigration, which to me is I get a little shiver when I think about debating Leonard Peikoff, it was a little crazy, was one of the reasons he agreed to do it and why I wanted to do it was we wanted to illustrate to the objectivist audience there can be disagreements in objectivism. We can have those debates and discussions. The word of the Ayn Rand Institute is not written on stone somewhere. It is not Ayn Rand. It is not even part of objectivism, technically. You know, uh, so, but it is, to the best of our knowledge, the best of our ability, the application of objectivism. And people are going to disagree about it. And I, I don't have a problem with people disagreeing with, as long as they do it respectfully and they do it, they do it honestly. But I don't think, I don't think an institute whose mission is to create a culture, <laughs> whose guiding principles are reason, da 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 can do it without massive application and showing the world what it looks like to apply. And, and that to me is the mission, right? So it's, it's I, I don't see any other way. And realizing that I take a risk that, so, that, that I offend you or somebody like you and they stop supporting us and that's happened. After 9-11, a lot of people stopped supporting the Institute because they didn't like the message. Uh, I know that around Trump, a lot of people have stopped supporting the Institute because they didn't like the message. I have to call it like I see it. I can't, I can't take a poll of my donors and figure out what, 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 how to apply and how to not apply based on democracy. Before we move to a broader topic of politics and capitalism, there is one more about Ayn Rand Institute uh, or even about the Institute Objective Standard Institute. Could you make any comment on the recent schism in the objectivist movement? No. Okay. So let's and move to politics. <laughs> Uh, let's move to but no. there's a question about the closed philosophy that, that Aaron asked early on. Oh. Aaron, would you like to, uh, I try to unmute you, would like to join us on video? Is he there? There he is. Yeah. I'd add video, but my internet is really questionable. Sorry. Don't um, worry, your question. I have a voice. Yeah. Uh, 
It just, it just was, Alan was one of the first to ask a question. So I thought we'd go to that. Go ahead. Thanks. Yep. Okay. This is going to be a rough ride, I think. Um, we, okay. Objectivism deals with the nature of reality. Am I right? It depends by what you mean. No, objectivism doesn't deal with anything. Objectivism is the philosophy of Ayn Rand. It's an actual name of something very concrete. Well, yeah, but part of that philosophy is our understanding of reality. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, when that understanding changes, you better have a way to write that into the source code of your philosophy, or your philosophy is wrong, uh, broken, like a, an operating system that needs a patch. And, you know, yeah, I, uh, I, I want to say I'm not, a, I'm not a physicist. I'm not an expert in quantum mechanics. So I want to be clear, I am stepping a bit outside of my expertise. And Absolutely. so I, I apologize a bit if I seem a bit out of my place, but uh, like I've read a little bit on how objectivists address things like quantum mechanics, the entanglement phenomenon, and they seem to think it's like some kind of trick uh, played on them. It's not, it's real. And that relates back to my point about the closed philosophy. Okay. How, okay. Do you, I, how are you going to address I, this? Yeah. Okay. So two things. Um, yeah, you're right. When, when something is discovered where Ayn Rand is wrong, it will need to be fixed. It just won't be objectivism. We'll call it something else. Why is that a problem? So I view myself as a truth seeker who happens at this point in my life to believe that Ayn Rand, her ideas are true. Not every little detail about everything she said about anything, but in general, the principles of the philosophy is true. If somebody came along and said, look, there's, a, there's a, something in metaphysics, it's off. Look, this is, this is a, then I'd say, great. You know, we've, we've taken a great leap forward in terms of the truth. But it's not objectivism. Now let's call it something else. Let's call it Randianism, or let's call it um, uh, whatever the person's name who discovered it after, or let's call it something, truthism. I don't know, whatever you want to call it. Um, it, it doesn't. In, in that sense, this is not some kind of, um, and by the way, it's interesting because let's say, let's say we disagree about the source code. Let's say you think this new invention is a new truth and, and uh, Joe thinks that this invention is complete BS and it's, it's wrong that Ayn Rand was right originally. What do we call it then? What do you call it? So we both call it objectivism and which version is the true version, which, I mean, so, Let's just call what Ayn Rand did objectivism. And then when you want to improve it, and I'm not being cynical here, that is, I believe it one day, some genius will be able to improve it. Call that whatever we want to call it later on. But we know clearly what Ayn Rand wrote and differentiate it from the truth. And that's all Ayn Rand asked. After all, all we're doing is following her uh, wishes. She said, I want objectivism to be the stuff I wrote or that I approved of so that in the future, there's no confusion about what is attributed to me versus what is me. So it's, it's, a, it's a property rights respect for somebody's wishes kind of notion. It's not a philosophical question at all, right? Nobody's debating that Ayn Rand is a closed system philosophically. It's a closed system in terms of the name you give it. Philosophy cannot be closed. Objectivism can. You know, and the same applies to other stuff. You know, um, nobody, nobody wants to attribute to Bernard, Bertrand Russell stuff that Bertrand Russell didn't write. And by the way, Bertrand Russell was wrong about everything. So if I improve Bertrand Russell's things about something, that doesn't make me a Russellian who's improved on Russell. That would be bizarre. It, you know, so one day there will be people who are influenced by Ayn Rand who think, true or not, that they've improved on her ideas. They won't call themselves objectivists, hopefully, although I think they will ultimately. They won't call themselves objectivists. They'll call themselves Randians, just like we call people Aristotelians or Platonists. They're not advocates of Plato or advocates of Aristotle. They're just influenced by them. And there will be a whole school of thought that is influenced by Ayn Rand, and there'll be a name for it. But what Ayn Rand asked is you don't call that objectivism, that you keep objectivism as the category that refers to what she wrote and what she advocated. So that's that. The second is quantum mechanics. 
There is no view in objectivism about quantum mechanics, qua physics. Some objectivists have a view about the interpretation of quantum mechanics. They have a view that even in the quantum world, A is A, and the law of causality holds. And by the way, even physicists, now I'm not a physicist and I know you're not a physicist, but this is my understanding as an engineer in a previous life of the state of physics. Even physicists, some physicists, disagree about the interpretation of quantum. The phenomena, nobody in objectivism has said the phenomena doesn't exist. That would be bizarre. And that's not a question of philosophy. That's completely a question of physics. How you interpret the phenomena is a philosophical question. And all objectivists have said, this is not objectivism, all objectivists have said, is that the conventional interpretation of quantum mechanics is wrong. And that there are others, and I know, I think I know three different objectivist physicists with three different alternative views, interpretations about quantum mechanics that are consistent with ASA and the law of causality. And I don't know which one is right, and I don't care, right? Because I don't care that much about quantum physics. It doesn't interest me that much. But it's, it's not an issue in objectivism other than to say the philosophical interpretation, the way people use quantum mechanics is wrong. You could say, hey, you guys are wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. The interpretation is right. Fine. Let's have a discussion about that. But that's more philosophical discussion than a physics discussion, or physics relates to it. And that's a discussion philosophers of science should have, not me and you who barely know any physics, we should avoid this conversation. Uh, but in terms of what the movement or what objectivism or what objectivists think of this, I think it's a misinterpretation um, to say that we reject quantum physics. I mean, that's ridiculous. Or, or, or we reject a certain interpretation. I forget the, the Bohr, inter is it the Bohr interpretation or the Baum interpretation? I always confuse those two physicists. But you know, and then, and then some objectivist philosophers show the link between Kantian philosophy and certain approaches to modern physics and why Kant's philosophy is harming modern physics, not, again, in the physics sense, but in, in the interpretation and the philosophy of science sense. And that is completely legitimate. You guys can ask questions in chat. Uh, please stay with... Uh topic of criticism, because I'm getting a lot of questions which are general Q&A, uh, questions about objectivism. You can ask them uh, on the Aaron Brook Show, you can become a patron, and you can ask many questions. Today we try to do uh, criticism. What is, uh, do, does Ayn Rand Institute use any KPIs, and what are those? Is this like a media hits, reach, or uh, do you measure somehow culture influence? So KPIs are really uh, are something we struggle with and we go back and forth constantly in terms of what are the best KPIs. Uh, and over the years, they have varied, but we have a number of KPIs. So everything driven in, in, um, in, at the Institute is goal oriented. And we we try to be as, um, you know, data driven as you can. So there are obvious KPIs like how much content do we produce? and how, uh, how, how much that content is consumed, that is consumption of content. Other KPIs have to do with consumption of Ayn Rand content. So uh, essay contests, um, uh, books to teachers, how many teachers teach Ayn Rand in the culture. Other KPIs might have to do with mentions of Ayn Rand in the media, that is uh, how much is she in the culture, right? How many citations in academic, in academic literature are there for Ayn Rand? So all of those, could be KPIs. But another important one that I've always said is how many intellectuals do we have and how many intellectuals are we trained and how many intellectuals are in our pipeline for being trained. Um, so a lot of those, uh, Tal, who is the new CEO, a lot of his KPIs are around the internet because, because we've decided in some way that the Ayn Rand Institute should be an internet company. Um, and, and to a large extent, it's about consumption of content, how much of our content is consumed, which relates to both awareness and understanding, and then how many people do we train? So I'd say those are the two big ones, consumption of content and how many intellectuals are trained, and that goes to uh, awareness, understanding, and acceptance. But it's a challenge because how do you measure 
influence on the culture, which is the ultimate KPI. I, I don't know if anybody comes up with a good KPI on that. Let me know. This one is a bit more personal. Could you support yourself without Ayn Rand Institute as a sole podcaster and public intellectual? Well, uh, support myself at what standard of living? I, I, I guess like... So I get very little money from the Ayn Rand Institute. So let's be clear today. Uh, I get a little bit of money to help them fundraise. And I get, I get paid when I give lectures, right? So per lecture. So when I come to Europe and give lectures, often the Ayn Rand Institute pays me. Could I survive? You know, it depends on the standard of living. A lot of people have told me, but the amount of money I get as a podcaster, they could survive. I couldn't because I, I, I live at a very high standard of living. Um, I spend a lot of money. Um, that's because I have a lot of money. That's because I've never only had one job in my life. I have been involved with a hedge fund uh, for 22 years. I am a managing, I'm the managing partner of the hedge fund today. That is my full-time job. All the stuff you do, you see me do podcasting, all the stuff you see me lecturing around the world, all that is my part-time job. My full-time job is actually running a hedge fund. So I'm a pretty busy guy. And running a hedge fund, I mean, running a part of a hedge fund is, you know, this year is not very lucrative. <laughs> this year I'm losing money. But other years is very lucrative. And um, so I could tomorrow stop doing everything in objectivism and, and live very well. I could tomorrow stop getting any money from the Institute, just do my podcast and my hedge fund and live very well. The amount of money I get from the Institute is, for me, relatively insignificant. If that answers people quite, not that I'm sure any of this is anybody's business, but okay. But uh, don't I... support the Institute, just so you know, today, uh, I don't get you know, very much money from the Institute at all. So the, I'm not a big uh, expense item on the Institute. Uh, when I worked there full time, I had a good salary. I think I did a good job. So I got a good salary. What do you invest in with your hedge fund? I invest in small community banks in the United States. I, I'm both long and short, but I can't talk about it because if I talk about it, the SEC will be down my throat. So I, I cannot publicly... All right. I can't be perceived as marketing it in any but, way. I can see. But do you, do you try to... I, know, I don't bring... use Austrian economics. I, 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 I don't use, you know, my, the, the, the trading strategy I have does not require knowledge of objectivism, although at the periphery, maybe some macroeconomic stuff. It doesn't. It's based on stuff that I did when I was an academic uh, a professor of finance in academia. My partner and I wrote some academic papers. They're published. You can find them in the Journal of Finance and the Journal of Quantitative and Financial Analysis. And the top financial journals, uh, we wrote papers describing a phenomena. And um, 22 years ago, a large hedge fund came to us and asked, hey, can you take your academic research and turn it into a trading strategy? And it turned out we could. And since then, um, you know, I've never made a huge amount of money, but I made enough money to live well, um, to live well uh, uh, above and beyond what I could ever make as a podcaster. I mean, unless I was a Jordan Peterson, he makes, he makes a lot of money just from public appearances. Nobody's paying me $100,000 a gig. When they do, we know objectivism is really winning. Good luck with your business. Uh, there you. comes uh, comments defending Polish freedom nationalism. Uh, they say that globally nationalism has become more of an abbreviation for anti-globalism rather than any nationalistic ideology. And it can be seen as a society egoism, as a collective egoism, like Western world defending itself together against some dangerous civilization. So I'm, by the way, I'm for that. Let's do away. Here's, here's, if you believe that, okay, let's do Western world. Fine. So let's get rid of Poland, merge it in with the rest of the countries in Europe, create a big country called Western Europe, Western civilization, whatever you want to call this new country, and then defend Western civilization. I'm, I'm all for that. You know, I'm, I'm, but I, I have a sense that Polish nationalists would not go for that, 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 you know, that they would reject that idea. So look, you, there is no such thing as collective egoism. 
Egoism is an attribute of individuals, not of collectives. Uh, the only self-interest of a collective is the self-interest of individuals within it. Um, I am not against um, defending Western civilization. I've kind of dedicated my life to defending Western civilization. I work hard at it. So uh, everything I do is focused on defending Western civilization. You don't need uh, walls around a state uh, focused on the nation in order to defend Western civilization. Indeed, Western civilization is a way to let down the walls and embrace anybody. I mean, hey, uh, uh, are the Poles willing to accept immigrants to the Middle East who embrace Western civilization? Are they willing to accept them as po the nationalists? Are they willing to accept them as full citizens of Poland, even though they're from the Middle East, if they embrace all the ideas of Western civilization? Um, probably not. Uh, are, the, are the Polish nationalists willing to accept Chinese refugees who want to embrace the values of Western civilization? So stop talking to me about Western civilization. You're talking about your particular genetic lineage, which is called Polish. That's what Polish nationalism is about. It's not a one iota of, of there's not one iota of Polish, of, nas, of Western civilization and Polish nationalism. Indeed, nationalism, particularly, is a rejection of, of Western, um, of, of, of uh, you know, Western ideology. Western ideology, and, and here is the term that makes me grumpy again, globalism. Ayn Rand had a term for this. It's called an anti-concept. It doesn't mean anything. It lumps together things that are legitimate and things that are illegitimate. What does globalism mean? It means, some people say, it means one world government. Well, I want to know how many people in the world today believe in one world government? Really? How many people in the world believe in one world government? Five? Five thousand? A hundred thousand, maybe? There's no movement to establish one world government. Now, does globalism mean globalization? Zero tariffs and the movements of goods across countries? I'm for that. Does that make me a globalist, even though I don't believe in one world government? What about does it mean movement of people across state lines? Does globalism mean that? Well, again, I'm for that generally, but I'm not for one world government. So what do you call me? I'm against one world government, pro-immigration, pro-trade. It's, it's an anti-concept that means nothing. It's supposed to lump you together with the United Nations. I hate the United Nations. There's not a person on the planet Earth who hates the United Nations more than I do. Does that make me an anti-globalist, even though I'm for immigration? It doesn't make any sense. Just the use of the term. The use of the term. So I am for fewer countries. I think there are way too many countries in the world. I think having 200 and something countries is ridiculous. What's the difference? between Macedon Northern Macedonia, can't even be Macedonia, Northern Macedonia, uh, Albania, Kosovo, um, uh, Montenegro, and uh, you know, the former Yugoslavia. What exactly is the differences between them? Why do we have 75 countries in that little piece of land? Ayn Rand wrote about this, by the way, in the 60s, just in case you're worried about that I'm deviating from objectivism. It was called global balkanization. And she wrote about the fracturing of countries and little countries here and little countries there. And everybody has a country based on what? Based on my, uh, you know, I, I, I'm from this tribe and you're from that tribe. And everybody has their little tribe that they want to have their little country for. I mean, that is barbarism and it's primitivism and it's a return to the Middle Ages. Right? There's no difference. I mean, who cares if you're Polish or not? Right? What matters is what kind of country do you have? What matters is what kind of life do you have? And if Ukrainians come in, who cares? Right? What's the difference between Poles and Ukrainians? Can we count the genes that make up the difference? But why won't you accept Ukrainians or Germans? Or I mean, the whole thing about this, about these arbitrary borders. So yes, there should be more than there should be more than one country. We want more than one country so we have options. So we can run away when our country gets bad instead of, you know, sacrificing for it. 
this is the anti-nationalist view, we can run away to a better country. But you don't need 200 and something countries to do that. Indeed, Europe shouldn't have as many countries as it does. There should be a lot of fewer countries. And uh, when your country gets really, really bad, you should leave it. And what you should fight for is the freedom to leave and the freedom to go somewhere where you can live a better life for yourself rather than building walls to keep you in and to keep others out, which is what all walls are built for. They, they start out as walls to keep others out and they soon become walls to keep you in. Is there some flow in, flow in capitalism? In, there is some weak point maybe or something dangerous about uh, that could come with a free world. Yeah, it's, it's dangerous. Life is dangerous. Uh, capitalism definitely has risk. If you think capitalism is risk-free, life just is some you, you Marxist utopia where stuff just shows up and everything's... Be no. Uh, ca capitalism requires risk, but risk is not a bad thing. Risk is not a negative. Now, it's not dangerous in the sense that, ooh, evil stuff. But no, there's no negatives to capitalism as long as you understand what negatives mean. I don't consider working hard a negative. I don't consider taking risk a negative. I don't consider being free a negative. So no, there's zero problems in that sense with capitalism. Capitalism is an ideal system, truly is ideal. Because what does it do? It leaves individuals free to live their life based on their values, pursuing their own happiness, using their own mind. How can that be bad? There's nothing bad about that. Zero, zilch, nothing. I have, for example, Jemovit here. Jemovit, are you with us? who uh, was making some comments about, about global warming and the climate change. Jimovi, do you have a question? Uh, I saw you chatting. I can't speak right now. Okay, let me, let me read his question then. Okay. Um, what is free market answer and solution to the issue of global warming and human influence on the environment? Especially what should we say to those who claim that due to pollution, etc human environment will worsen. I'm not sure if this is the uh, Jemovit question, but I have a second. One of them is from him. So there is two. Could capitalism and progress be considered dangerous to the future of the planet and the mankind? What would be the objectivist response to the potential issue of planet pollution or a global pandemic? So there is. So first, um, there are legitimate issues around pollution. And those issues are dealt with by private property. It's, it's really simple, right? If everything was private, which is what capitalism is, capitalism, everything is private. The rivers are private. The beaches are private. The parts of the ocean are private. Um, you know, airspace is even privatized in a sense that, you know, how far airplanes have to be above your property and things like that. So you privatize everything, then it's easy to deal with pollution. You can't dump your garbage in my backyard. We all know that. That's pretty straightforward. So the solution to most um, pollution problems is private property. Um, if you spew something into there that causes me to be sick, I sue you. And if enough people sue over a particular issue, it's completely legit. And, and the courts using science determine that they're right, that harm did come to them, then it's completely legitimate for legislature to pass a law that says this product cannot be spewed into the air. But it has to be objective. It has to go through a process. It has to be proven in a court of law that this is truly bad. And it really causes damage. And you can ob objectively, scientifically prove that that damage occurs. So that's how you solve almost every issue of pollution. Now, you could argue that global warming is different, right? Because global warming is just our activity, everybody's activity, it's not any one person's activity, is causing uh, significant changes um, in the atmosphere that are going to kill us all. You know, that, that's the caricature version, right? Let's say that were true. Okay. Then how do we figure out voluntarily, how do we figure out ways to convince people to change their behavior in ways that stop this, or, which I think is the better solution, how do we convince people to invest in technologies that reverse the process? I mean, the technologies, for example, that suck CO2 out of the air. 
There's a technology that puts stuff in the atmosphere that cools the planet down, right? You better, you better be right about global warming before you do that. Otherwise, you'll get global cooling. There are lots of technologies that can be, and, and there are lots of people out there, the Bill Gates, uh, the, uh, the um, Amazon, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Bezos. Bezos, there's, there's uh, uh, Elon Musk, there's all these billionaires who really care about the world, care about life. Why wouldn't they be investing if, if really there was a problem and you left it and you, you didn't have government force it down our throat, they would be investing, instead of going to Mars, they'd be investing in technologies that made it possible for us to save the planet. Not save the planet because the planet, Mother Earth will be angry, but save the planet because they live on the planet and they're human beings and they want to make, they want to make life possible on the planet. See, if this was an existential risk, I think they would take, take up the pandemic, right? The only person I know who took pandemic seriously about five years ago, talked about it, and then put his money where his mouth is, is Bill Gates. So Bill Gates, five years ago, gave a talk at TED saying we were vulnerable as a society to pandemics. He then started, his foundation started a uh, nonprofit research program, I forget the name of it, with some other philanthropists, and I think with some governments, and they started this thing to study and to start developing a platform for creating vaccines when, for pandemics when they hit. Great. I think that's wonderful. There's a voluntary way of dealing with future vaccines. Now, unfortunately, if he had done that 10 years earlier, I think we would have a, we would have a vaccine today for, for, for uh, SARS, you know, for, for COVID. Um, but, it, you know, it's, it's still young. They're still developing. They're still working on this platform. And hopefully one day we'll be able to develop vaccines like this because of investments that Bill Gates made. Um, and the, th risk, the risk of pandemics for the, for globally will be reduced dramatically. Those are the kind of things that stop global kind of phenomena. And there's, there's other technologies that could reduce the impact of global warming. Uh, but first, you have to be convinced, one, that it's real, the global warming. And two, you have to make it something that people do voluntarily, not something that's crammed down their throat by government. And by the way, governments are doing nothing about it. Even the governments that pretend that they're very environmentally friendly, like Germany, is not doing anything about it. The CO2 emission is going up dramatically. So even the governments that pretend are not doing anything about it. So why even count in governments? Let the market work. And the market, the idea that participants in the market don't care about the destruction of mankind is nuts. Participants in the market, greedy capitalists, care more about the health of mankind than anybody else. They're part of mankind. They live in mankind. They customers of mankind. Everything around them is mankind. They would invest in this and they would solve the problem much better than any government is going to solve the problem. Okay, uh, we're going to wrap it, wrap it up soon. I yep. have two last questions uh, regarding the strategy. Yaron, do you own Bitcoin? No. Uh, why? Why and why Ayn Rand Institute is not promoting Bitcoin in enough? Since it seems is the best tool that can help us give freedom and privacy from government and major financial institutions. Well, this is the biggest market player in a sphere of money. Uh, why this tool is not so much promoted or supported by ARI? Well, I don't buy it because I don't understand. I buy stuff that I understand, and I don't understand what the value is. What's Bitcoin worth? Today, like nine thousand dollars. Why? 9, Why is it worth nine thousand? Well, because probably people who want to buy it, they want to pay so much for some. Yeah, from some it, it's it's completely detached from reality, in my view. It doesn't reflect anything real. It's it's not clear to me what the value should be. Should it be eleven thousand? Should it be two thousand? It it's hugely volatile. It can't be money because money. The, one of the basic principles about money is that its value is stable. So anything that's volatile cannot be money. And one of the reasons when, when fiat money disappears is when it becomes volatile, when it, comes, when it becomes so, you know, when it goes like this, right? I don't, 
you can't use Bitcoin, right? Because if I go and buy something, well, the next day it could be 10% more, 10% less. Well, did I get a good deal? Did I get a bad deal? Did it, what, is, what is it value? So until Bitcoin becomes money, I can't use it as money. And it won't become money until it stabilizes over price. I don't believe it'll ever stabilize over price because I don't believe anybody can actually articulate how you value it. Like the value of gold is stable in history. Its purchasing power is stable. And it's been stable for thousands of years, relatively speaking. And when you discover new gold, the, the price fluctuates a little bit, but not by much. And it, it's, you know what gold can buy approximately. Now people today speculate on it because it's viewed as a financial asset, not as money. But when it was money, you always knew what you could buy with gold. I do not know what I can buy with Bitcoin. I have no idea what I can. I know what I can buy today, but I don't know what I'd be able to buy in a week. As long as it is speculative, it cannot be money. And I, I don't think it will ever be money. Certainly not in a free market. I think in a free market, Bitcoin, the value of Bitcoin goes to zero. So here's why I think Bitcoin has value. But I don't know how to price it. I'm a finance guy, right? I, I, I like discount of present value. I like, to, I, like, I like real things. Bitcoin's value is that you can use it to, buy, to do illegal stuff, right? You can use it to buy drugs. You can use it to buy weapons. And you can use it to move capital from country to country when your country has capital constraints, right? So you can do things anonymously, which, you know, the real value of doing things anonymously, most of the time, I don't care about anonymity, right? I use my credit card every day. When do I care about anonymity? When I'm about to do something illegal, when I don't want the government to know, right? When I really care. Now, I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just saying that's a fact. The fact is that Bitcoin and all cryptocurrency get their value from, from, a, from people's desire to do things illegally, maybe justifiably, maybe not, but to do things that are illegal in, the, in where they live. So the real value of Bitcoin and all cryptocurrency, at, at, right now at least, is how, how valuable is it to you or me or to anybody to engage in illegal activity? And it's true that as society deteriorates, as the state becomes more intrusive, as our freedoms shrink, the value of Bitcoin will go up because it becomes more valuable to do illegal stuff because more stuff is illegal, right? You want the state less in your life. But I don't know how to value that. I don't know how to put a number of that. I, and, and again, that is constantly changing. It's constantly fluctuating. You know, if, if the more China cracks down on freedom in China, the more crypto will go up in price. I also don't understand what the difference is between Bitcoin and 100 other cryptocurrencies. There are lots of them. To me, that indicates inflation, right? The fact that there are lots of cryptocurrencies. You don't have to rely on one. There are just too many of them. And I don't know how to value them relative to one another. I, and I, again, I don't know how anybody values them. I've, I've talked to crypto guys. I don't know how to value them. Um, they believe. All right. Well, I don't believe. Um, I don't know if, 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 if Bitcoin is the one that will survive and others won't survive. Um, anyway, and in a free market, since everything is basically legal, you know, not everything, but, but uh, everything reasonable is legal, uh, cryptocurrency's value will go to zero. Um, and uh, you'll have stuff that's based on gold. It might be crypto, it might be, but everything will be private. All transactions will be private. The government won't have access to any of it. So who, why, why, have, why have Bitcoin or any, anything like that? You can have gold. You can have a cryptocurrency backed by gold, which I think is the solution ultimately. You need a physical... Money needs to be physical. Money needs to have a value beyond its use as money. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it won't survive in, free, in a free market. It'll survive in a world of fiat money because nothing's physical in a world of fiat money, but it will not survive in a world of free markets. In a free market, there are no crypto that are just zeros and ones that have no base in the physical world. And I know you just say I'm old and I don't understand, but uh, that's okay. I'm, I'm willing to accept that. Um, you guys are young and you don't understand. <laughs> uh, next time you come to Poland, I will try to arrange you some debate with a, uh, with a Bitcoin libertarian or somebody. Uh, I would like to hear the crypto you. guy. I mean, it would be a big waste of time, but sure. I don't think it's an important issue. Who cares? You guys think it's, it's, it crypto is valuable. Go buy crypto. 
you know, you know, why, 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 why make a big deal out of it? You know, I, I, theoretically, it makes most sense in a free market. And that I, that's not hard to prove. It, it loses all its value. I would like to hear the debate. In a free market, good money drives out bad money. In a unfree market, bad money drives out good money. And so fiat and crypto drives out gold in a bad, in a mixed economy, which is what we have today. But in a good market, gold would drive out all other forms of money. So if not the Bitcoin, where, in what group, organization, tool, do you see the biggest opportunity for ideas of freedom to actualize? In, you know, the... the well, because, uh, example, example, uh, some people... Bitcoin, claim, like, let me just be clear. Bitcoin actualizes your, your potential for freedom? Uh, yes, I can use money which is not in the hands of anybody. It's not in the control of the supply of the money. It's not in the hands of the government. It, it, but, it, but it's in the hands of speculators. The value of what the value of your money, it's not money. Get rid of that idea because it's not money. But the value of Bitcoin, the asset that you're investing in, changes, can change 10, 20, 30 percent in one day. That can't be money. So it's an asset that's speculative. Great, buy it. I mean, that's fine. But you're not you're not expressing your freedom by doing that. I can buy real estate, I can buy lots of assets that are not controlled by the by the government. I can buy gold. And it's not controlled by the government. Its supply is not controlled by the government. So there's nothing unique about Bitcoin. And it again, it cannot serve as money. If I'm a, if I'm a uh, seller of things, I'm not going to put a price on my goods unless that in Bitcoin, unless that price can change every single minute based on the value of Bitcoin in that given minute. And basically, what that does is it links Bitcoin to the to, to the dollar. What does that do? So. You know, it's a fantasy you guys have that you, you think you're using Bitcoin so you're cool and cool means freedom, but it doesn't. It doesn't mean freedom. You gain no freedom by using it. It's an asset. I invest in assets all the time. All right. I'm glad you can do it. I'm not against, I'm not for banning it or anything like that. I'm for complete freedom. When it comes to Bitcoin, I just think under complete freedom, it goes away. And don't you think that like investing in Bitcoin would be more moral than investing in Chinese Huan. Yen. I think the only thing about investing is to, 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 to make money. I mean, there's no moral about what you invest in, unless you're investing in something that actually is the pursuit of, uh, of slavery. Well, you know, what is, you know, investing is to make money. Well, by if I, if I'm going to lose money by investing in Bitcoin, then it's immoral because you're worse off. You're worse off because you lost money. What's okay, good so about that? Okay, so there is maybe there is some other tool which you find unique and an opportunity for, for spreading objectivism. Some people thought in 90s that internet is something that will bring liberty to people as it brings knowledge. Do you think it is internet or maybe something else, some project, maybe some... Nothing brings liberty to people. People have to embrace liberty. And the only way people will embrace liberty is by adopting a philosophy of liberty, by adopting ideas of liberty. So the only way you can get liberty is by educating people about it. There's no shortcuts. There's no gimmicks. The internet is still an amazing tool for educating people about liberty. It won't bring you liberty. It isn't liberty in and of itself. It is a means of communication. It, it, you look at this. We're talking here that people here from Poland, that I saw somebody from Israel before, that people in the United States, there's, some, there's somebody from the UK was on before, that people from all over the world interacting and getting hopefully some education about the ideas of liberty. That's all you can do. The idea that there's some gimmick, there's some product, there's some investment that will create liberty. It just doesn't work. World doesn't work that way. The, what, what is required is to get, in, 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 to get people to think differently. And only education can get people to think differently. And then the internet becomes a great tool to educate people. Maybe you can use Bitcoin to educate people about monetary standards and to educate, and that's a in into liberty. But you can't, it's just a tool. All these things are just tools. They're not liberty in and of themselves. Liberty has to be established. And it's going to require a lot of work to establish liberty. So what is the, big, the biggest challenge or threat 
to spreading objectivism and making the world and society more reasonable and, and free. Well, the biggest threat is, is, is unreason. The biggest threat is the inability of people to think. The big, and the biggest threat is diluting and perverting the philosophy. The biggest threat are the nationalists, the socialists, the conservatives, the anarcho-capitalists, the, the, the people who, um, who are ideologically different than what we are, right? They, they, they're ideologically opposed to opposition. This is a battle of ideas. It's not a battle of gimmicks. It's not a battle of propaganda. It's not a battle of marketing. It's a battle of philosophies. And until... You know, the biggest threat to our philosophy is all philosophies that are, that, that are opposed to our philosophy, right? So it's a philosophical, it's a philosophical struggle. And that's, that means a lot of discussions, a lot of debates, a lot of Q&As, a lot of lectures, a lot of books, a lot of articles, a lot of books, more books, more books, more books. I know nobody reads anymore, but it's still the people who matter ultimately read. It's about getting the word out there. And, and, and you know, and I think... In a sense, wasting one time on looking for a gimmick, looking for a shortcut is wasting one's time. And we don't have time because the world is going in the wrong direction. And what we should be doing is advocating for ideas, for philosophy, for, you know, a, a, a revolution, a moral revolution, an ethical revolution. Until you get that, all this other stuff, it doesn't matter. All right. We are about to do this for two hours, so thank you guys all for for watching and attending this uh, this event. I hope it was interesting for you. Uh, let me also, if you want to thank Yaron Brook, you can go to yaronbrookshow.com and you can subscribe. Watch. Yeah, his please subscribe to my podcast. Podcast. There are all links to Facebook, to Twitter, YouTube, and and Apple iTunes. Uh, you can click support. You can send some money, you can chip in uh, to say thank you to our guest today. If you want to thank me for putting this up, you can go to uh, Facebook slash Objectivism. And